All right, guys, welcome back to Revive School. Lesson 39, Psalms 23, 24, and 25. Now, when you, when you look at these three chapters, Kevin, right away, which chapter should you think we should teach on? Well, the easy one to teach on that everybody would teach on is Psalm 23. Yeah, let's just not talk about that one today. So that's not what we're going to, we're, we're actually going to teach on Psalm 24. Uh, why? Because to us, not that we don't love Psalm 23 and that the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. That's not it. It's more of, remember for us, we're just trying to paint a bigger picture of where do you see the coming Messiah in all of these chapters. And we just felt like 24 talks about the theme uh, possibly of all of the book of Psalms. Now, to kind of give a backdrop here just a little bit, Psalm 22, Psalm 23, and Psalm 24 they kind of all go together. It's really cool how this works. Now, remember yesterday we talked about, remember, uh, about Jesus being the good shepherd in Psalm 22? And then we talked about, in, in, in reference to dying, right? He dies. And we talked about the great shepherd in 20, 23, which we haven't, which talks about how he cares for us, right? And then you talk about the chief shepherd. This is fun to me, where he returns. The chief shepherd returns for his sheep. Now, Rich, you came up with through FBI, FB, FBI, <laughs> through FB Meyer's help, and I like this. Okay, Rich, where did you see Psalm 22? What did FB say here? Um, he said that Psalm 22 tells of the cross. The cross, good. What Psalm 23 talk about? The crook. Which? What are you talking about by the crook? The shepherd's crook. Okay, and then what do you see in uh, Psalm 24? Psalm 24 is uh, the crown. And when you're talking about the crown, he's not talking necessarily about the crown of thorns, kind of, yes, but more about the king. The king. The king. Okay, so that's where we're going today. We're going to go here specifically with the chief shepherd returning with the crown, which we would then say for our theme of the book of, dun, 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 the book of Psalms <laughs> is the king of glory. Who do we see and how do we see Christ in all of all of uh, the book of Psalms, many painted it here with the crown, the king of glory. So we're going to unpack kind of what this looks like. We're going to do our best. Now, here's the crazy thing about Psalm 24, just so we're all on the same page. Okay, it could have been used, okay, this could have been written at the time of bringing the ark to Jerusalem, okay? I'm going to give you multiple scenarios of what this could have been, okay? Interesting enough, the early church... They designated Psalm 24 as an ascension psalm. Now, Rich, you've been to Jerusalem. What is an ascension psalm? Any thoughts? Uh, that would be a psalm, something that you sing as you are going up to Jerusalem. Outside of Jerusalem, you're always walking up. So if you're a kid on valley, because there's valleys that surround Jerusalem. That's kind of the mentality. So when you look at the book of Psalms, okay, so like in Psalm 120, you see these guys, it's a song of ascents. So they're singing and reading these psalms as they go up to Jerusalem. So they're saying possibly uh, Psalm 24 could be a psalm of ascent that you're singing as you go up to Jerusalem. Many people, 100%, no questions asked, would equate this to a royal psalm. It's a royal psalm, a messianic psalm. Now, here's what would happen. Wearsby says this. Okay, this whole song in verses 1 through 2, okay, I'm going to kind of give you as a choir director, what the song, how the song is put together, okay? So the very first two verses, people opened up with verses. Kevin, you tell me when you're ready to jump in and sing, okay? And then verses 3, 8, and 10, the leader in the song asks questions, okay? So people are singing the verses, the leader asks the questions, and then there's this chorus, verses 4 through 6, verses 8, and verse 10, uh, B, we're in uh, Psalm 24, and so I want to just give you an example. Who is this King of Glory? This is what they're singing. This is the, the constant theme. So people open up with verses, the leader's asking the questions, and then the chorus is answering with their verses. Some would say that they sung this in Herod's temple each Sunday. Kind of an interesting thought. And then some actually comment that the psalm, okay, according to Wearsby, uh, was used with the Lord's entrance into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, okay? Couple different times of when you can use this. And here's one other scenario of a historical backdrop of Psalm 24. Some actually read it on Ascension Day, which would have been the 40th day after 
Easter. Not to be funny, okay? Kevin, uh, yeah, Psalm 24, verse 3 says, Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? When we say uh, Ascension Day, what, what does that mean? Uh, it'd be the day the Lord went up in a cloud. Jesus left the earth in his physical state. Okay, so go to Acts 1, because I think this is going to help. My prayer is that this helps paint a picture for the whole psalm. Okay, you're going to see a little bit about this. If you go to Acts 1, verse 9, okay. So he had just interacted. He had just promised the Holy Spirit with his folks. He had just said, I need you to hang in here a little bit longer because I'm going to give you some help. You're going to receive power. The Holy Spirit is going to come on you and you're going to be my witnesses. And he says in verse 9, after he said this, he was taken up as they were watching. And a cloud took him up out of, out of their sight. This is the ascension day. When Christ, who had died, buried, came back to life, how many days was he here on earth? 40. 40 days. So then after Easter, on the 40th day, this is called Ascension Day. Okay? This is important because this actually possibly is in reference to Psalm 24. Okay? So when we start talking about an Ascension Psalm, that's what we're talking about. So we're saying eventually you're going to get to the point where Christ is actually the King of Glory. Okay, everybody, I think we're all on the same, same page here. Um, can you go to Colossians 2, verse 15 for me, please, Kevin? Yeah, okay, I'm going to read this, and I'll tell you why here in a little bit, okay? It says, He disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them public, publicly. He triumphed over them by Him, okay? So this ascension, there's going to be this, this thought behind it of triumph. Okay, just to kind of go through here of what, what he's going to overcome. And then can you go to Ephesians 4, 8, and then we'll get into Psalms 24. Can you go to Ephesians 4, 8, the same mentality, okay? It says, for, it's, for, he, it, for it says, when he ascended on high, he took prisoners into captivity, he gave gifts to people. Okay, can you go a little bit more here just so they get a backdrop? But what does he ascended mean? except that he descended to the lower parts of the earth. Okay, keep going here, verse 10. The one who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Whew, all right. <laughs> so because of his death, burial, and resurrection, he was then given the right to ascend into heaven. Does that make sense? Rich, am I, am I on this? Is this correct? You're doing good. Okay, so that allowed him to then triumph, okay, over all that took place. And when I say all, I mean all. <laughs> all right, that's your backdrop, okay? That's really, really important to understand when we get into Psalm 24. Let's do that, Kevin, if we can. Let's go to verse one. Verse one, it just says this, okay? And there's gonna be different stages that we're gonna walk through. The earth and everything in it, the world and its inhabitants belong to the Lord. So, in other words, what you're going to see is I'm going to walk through. MacArthur does a pretty good job of, he, he breaks it up into stages, okay? And, and he describes, he says, the, you're going to see the worship of the Creator. I'm just going to leave it at that. The worship of the Creator through contemplation, okay? So what he, that's why I left that part off. <laughs> the worship of the Creator, okay, is going to be in verses 1 through 2. And what he says is, think about this, the earth and everything in it, the world and its inhabitants, it belongs to the Lord. For he laid its foundation on the sea and established it on the river. Everything is the Lord's. Everything. Everything is the Lord's. It's universal ownership. If you go to Exodus 19, verse 5. Okay, I'm going to go through stages. I think this is a really cool, it, it's, like, it's like big picture and then it narrows it down to us. Now, if you'll listen to me and carefully keep my covenant, you will be my, look at this, my own possession out of all of the peoples, although all the earth is mine. Israel, you're going to be mine, but oh, by the way, so is the earth. So I want you to have this perspective of worshiping me as the creator. This is really, really important. A big picture. Just a couple other images. Psalm 50, verse 12. Uh, if I were hungry, I would not tell you for the world and everything in it is mine. I love that. If, if I was hungry, I wasn't going to tell you, God said. <laughs> but what he says is the world and everything in it, it, it's mine. This is mine. Okay, I want you to have this perspective in the Royal Psalms 
uh, of worshiping the Creator. Now it says He laid the foundation on its seas. He established it on the rivers. All I can just tell you, you guys, is that all throughout the Old Testament, it references is verse 2. Just go to Genesis 1, 9, and 10. And I'm only going to do one in this example, but it is over and over and over. We need to worship Him as a, as a Creator. Then God said, let the water under the sky be gathered into one place. Let the dry land appear. And it was so. Verse 10 says, God called the dry land earth, and He called the gathering of the water seas, and God saw that it was good. Look, He laid its foundation on the seas. It's pretty clear in Genesis 1. And He established it on the rivers. I have two, four, six, eight, nine references just in verse 2, just to give you an idea. Okay, now watch. As we go to stage 2, okay, that's, that's, that's big picture, right? Worship Him of the Creator. Now, here's where it gets kind of fun. It starts getting a little bit more personal. Worship of the Savior. Okay? And you're going to see that in verses 3 through 6. It says, Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in His holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not set his mind on what is false, and who has not sworn deceitfully. I'm going to read through this and then we'll come back on it. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Okay, so there it is. See the, the salvation reference. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob, Selah. Okay, so what, what are we supposed to do at Selah? Pause. Okay, so we'll come back to this pause in a second, okay? So who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? So these are questions, typically when you're talking about the mountain of the Lord, when you're talking about standing in his holy place, usually it was only, only the priests. Usually it was only the, the, the Levites. But in this context in verse 4, and David is talking about this, he says, hey, look, here are the qualifiers if you want to enter in the presence of the Lord. Clean hands and a pure heart. If you're not setting your mind on what is false and you're not swearing uh, deceitfully. And so here you have in this cool image of just worship, probably one of my favorite ways to describe David is clean hands and a pure heart. I love what Nelson says. The clean hands imply that your, your actions, they, they describe the person's actions and the pure heart actually describes the inner attitude. So you're talking about the outer and the inner when you're talking about who are able to come and stand in his place. Uh, I think you guys have heard me say this over and over and over again. If you go to Psalm 78, 70 through 72, I used to have actually uh, a poster as a maintenance man in my, uh, in my shop. <laughs> I made this little canvas uh, just as a reminder. It says, Psalm 78, 70 through 72, it says, He chose David, his, she his servant, and took him from the sheepfolds. 71 says, He brought him from tending ewes to be shepherd over his people Jacob, over Israel his inheritance. In verse 72, it says, He shepherded them with a pure heart, and he guided them with his skillful hands. So here you have a description of the King David. And now he's actually referencing Psalm 24. And look how they, they interact. Because of clean hands, because of a pure heart, because of skillful hands, because of a pure heart, he's able to actually, there are qualities that allow him to walk into the presence of God. Now, let me make a distinction. MacArthur says, and I think it's really important. This does not signify like a sinless perfection. He's not implying you have to be perfect in order to experience the presence of God. Rather, he is implying, though, that he's a, there's a basic integrity of inner motives and outward manners. Psalm 24 and Psalm 15 really, really parallel. Parallel. Psalm 15 talks about like you're allowed to approach, ascend and approach in righteousness. That's what we're talking about here. We're talking about these things reference the righteousness. Crazy enough, it says in verse 5, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. So look how that works, you guys. What does he receive? He receives righteousness. He'll receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of salvation. So, do you catch this? He receives it. He receives blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. David received righteousness from his Savior. So in, in Psalm 24, it's, this, it's macro to micro. In my mind, this is maybe that might not be an accurate statement, but it goes from creator to now savior to you're going to get even more specific. Okay, we'll watch this. And it just says in verse six, such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of God, uh, the God of Jacob, Selah. So I just don't miss this, you guys. 
you can actually receive uh, blessing and righteousness from the Savior when you worship Him. Okay, here's what I want to do. Stage three. MacArthur talks about worship of the King. In verses 7 through 10. And that's it. That's all the verses that we have in this context. And this is where we're going to hang out today. <laughs> and we're going to spend a lot of time on the king. Kevin, are you warming up? Who is the king of glory? <laughs> were you sounding that out or was that your song? It's not the final product. That's not the final product. Okay, so it says in verse 7, okay, the scripture says this, Lift up your heads, you gates. Rise up ancient doors then the king of glory will come in. All right, this is a weird image to me. It's not like the gates can actually be like, oh yeah, oh. <laughs> you know, so like what MacArthur says, the city gates, they needed to, in reference to this, they needed to stretch themselves, think about this, to make way for the awesome entrance of the great king. The gates actually got to participate, according to this verse, in worshiping the king. I need you, the scripture says, to get ready because then the king of glory will come in. Normally, when a king walks by, what do you normally do? You bow down. You bow down. And in this context, as strange as it sounds, but I love Constable's picture, as the gates are experiencing the king of glory, they're actually told to rise up. And so here's what it says in verse 8, and then we're going to unpack this. Who is this king of glory? Now, remember, I told you, right? People are answering. The leader's actually asking questions. And so here you have in, in their singing and then the chorus is answering the verses. And so it's like this dialogue of a choir director, the choir, choir director, choir, right? And so here you say in verse eight, who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. I mean, basically what you're saying is, is that there's praise for the king who is actually fresh from, fresh from the battle. This king uh, uh, clearly is, has won and clearly is going to win. I love what Constable says. He's omnipotent. He sees the victory already over the enemies. I mean, he's Israel's, Israel's. He's Israel's divine king and he's glorious because he's, he, he, he can't lose. Who is this king of glory? Lift up your heads, you gates. Rise up ancient doors. Then the king of glory will come in. Now in verse seven, exact verse. Lift up your heads, you gates. Rise up ancient doors, and the king of glory will come in. Verse 9, lift up your heads, you gates. Rise up ancient doors, then the king of glory will come in. Two times you sing this, this part of, of uh, the gates rising up, the doors rising up, and then the king of glory comes in. And then in verse 10 it says, well, who is he? Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory. So they, they answer the question. Who is this king? And he says, well, it's the Lord of hosts. It's, he is the king of glory. So let's begin to unpack all that this looks like. And I have to tell you, there's a lot. And so my prayer is, is that this, the next, you know, eight plus minutes will just truly for you guys just begin to start making sense. All right. So Kevin, remember when we talked about the very beginning, we talked about Acts 1. Okay. What, what was the Acts 1 reference? Just so we can be on the same page. The Lord ascending into heaven. Okay. So now, there was one ascension, okay? In, uh, in verse seven, it says, lift up your heads, you gates, rise up, you ancient doors, and the king of glory will come in. Many people will say they're talking about two instances in Psalm 24. Verse seven could be in reference, again, I'm saying could be in reference, okay? To, here it is, the leaders rejecting Jesus and they sent him to Golgotha, right? Where he died. However, we know that Jesus won, and then look what it says. It says he, he ascended back into heaven, Okay, we know that in Acts 1. What did he do? He went back into heaven and he went into, entered into, into the heavenly Zion where he was received as the victorious Lord of hosts and the King of glory, correct? So we know that at least one time he's come and that he's left. So my point is this, is that the King of glory has already entered one time. He's come here to earth and he's gone into heaven. It's going to happen again. So in verse nine, what you're going to see, okay, just to say it again, lift up your heads, you gates, rise up ancient doors, then the king of glory will come in. Some would propose this is talking about his return, okay? Some would say verse nine, again, all I'm trying to show you is, is the process. 
All I'm trying to show you is, is that in Jerusalem, the people need to get ready. Okay? Some would say, the Jews would say, well, he's got to come back the first time. Gentiles would say he's got to come back a second time. Kevin? Is this, I mean, when we study, a lot of times we say the Jews were looking for someone who was going to come as a warrior in a battle in this realm, where in reality, he did the battle in another realm. You think about this. We, we talked about this. So Zechariah 12.10 says, eventually the Jewish people are going to mourn over the people that, they're going to mourn over, uh, remember Psalm, 23, uh, Psalm 22, that, that he's already died and suffered. They're going to mourn over the fact that they've already pierced him. The king can come back the second time because he's already gone through the ultimate battle. He's already gone through the ultimate suffering, which I think is why verse 9, to me, it really makes sense to me, is that Jesus, and I love what Wearsby says, he's going to return to earth and fight the battle against the armies of the world and be victorious. Revelation 19, 11. Revelation 19, 11. Again, you guys, there's two choruses. They could have just sang the chorus twice, and that's all it could mean. I totally admit that. And Revelation 19, 11 says, Then I saw heaven open. What an awesome picture. And there was a white horse. Its rider is called Faithful and True, and he judges and makes war and righteousness. He's coming back. He's going to be called Faithful and True. <laughs> and he's going to deliver Jerusalem from her enemies. And he's going to establish his kingdom here on earth. And then his people will receive him in Jerusalem. And it says, Kevin, in Zechariah 14.9, if you'll go there. I love this image. In Zechariah 14.9. Zechariah 14.9, it, it says this. On that day, Yahweh will become king over all the earth and Yahweh alone in his name alone. Who is this king of glory? Can I just describe to you what happened to me in Minneapolis over the holidays? I was with my kids and I was sounding out, what does it mean, the king of glory? Like just from a dad kids discussion. Like here we're talking about, okay, Jesus was killed, dead, buried, came back to life. He ascended to heaven and they're saying gates get ready because the king of glory is coming back. And in verse nine, guess what? In Psalm 24, it says he's coming back. Well, to me, when I think of king of glory, I automatically go to the word glory. The word glory actually means weight. It actually implies his presence. Like you can feel his presence. So to me, when I think of the king of glory, you know what I think of? I think of Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father. And I think all of a sudden the presence of God is going to come back into Jerusalem. He's going to come back to this earth. He's going he's to totally win. <laughs> And he's coming because he's God in human flesh. So when I think of king of glory, I think of God showing up on a horse, kicking rear, honestly, and everybody worshiping him. And I think about who is this king of glory? I think, oh, by the way, everybody better get ready. Gates, you better get ready. Da doors, you better get ready. And so to me, when I talk to my kids, the king of glory is this God in human flesh coming in on a horse saying, let's go. And oh, by the way, I need all of us to get ready. The crazy thing is the first time he entered into Jerusalem, why some would say it was done on Palm Sunday, because he came riding on a donkey. And the gates and the doors had to get ready for him to enter into the city. And oh, by the way, he's coming back again, but this time he's coming back on a horse. And he's coming back on a horse because it's the end. And he needs every single one of us to get ready and function in life as conquerors of Christ. So how, how, how do you get ready? How do you get ready for a king that came in once on a donkey, now a king that's going to come in on a horse? How do you get ready for this? Like, how, do you raise your hands like a door or a gate? Do you open up? What, what do you do? Are you constantly worshiping him? Are you constantly playing Hillsong music and Jesus culture? <laughs> like, what do you do? Like, that's a question that I think so many of us have to understand as we get ready for the return, the chief shepherd to come back with his crown and say, yes, let's go for the king of glory to show he's God in human flesh. How do we, how do we experience this? I think for me, there's a couple ways. I'm just going to give you three examples. And I just want to write these down because this is how you can worship the king. This is how you can, how you can get ready. You know, in Luke 12, 35 through 48, I love what Stephen Cole says. Stephen Cole says, in order to be ready, he has got to be, he must be your master. I mean, that's bottom line. He has to be your master in order for you to be ready. Can you go to Matthew 7, Kevin, if you don't mind, 
22 through 25, uh, 23. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name and do many miracles in your name? And in verse 23, he says, then I will announce to them, I never knew from you, never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. Just because you go to church on Sunday doesn't mean you're ready. Just because you go to church on Wednesdays and do Bible studies, it doesn't mean you're ready. What it does mean is, is that he must be in charge of your life. Really, you know what it means? It means he's your master. It means that you have given everything over to him. Which is why I love what Stephen Cole says. He says, aside from him being your master, you know what that implies? You must be his servant. He must be your master. You must be his servant. I know that sounds obvious, but if he's in charge of everything, guess what? You're serving him at all times. That's how you're ready. Oh, hang on, hang on. I'll get, I'll get to that later, Jesus. Yeah, I'm watching, watching a good game. Good, good game. Oh, I got to have a party. got to have a feast. But isn't that the truth? A servant doesn't sit there and say, I'll get to it later. A servant is constantly saying, let's go, because the king of glory is coming. And you want to do everything you can to get ready. And so Stephen Cole says it pretty, pretty well. If he's your master and you're his servant, you must live in expectation of his return. Luke 12, verse 37. References this very well. Luke 12, verse 37, it just says this. Uh, Those slaves, the master will find alert. When he comes, will be blessed. I assure you, he'll get ready. Have them recline at the table, then come and serve them. And then verse 40, Kevin, if you'll go there, Luke 12, verse 40. You also must be ready because the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. But it means you expect him to come back. And who do we expect to come? The King of Glory. All right, guys. Uh, Psalm 24. A lot there. Uh, Take some time, because it says at the end of verse 10, does it not, Kevin? Uh, Who is this? Who is he, this King of Glory, the Lord of hosts? He is the King of Glory, Selah. So, Lord, I'm just going to ask that as we close up today, you would allow us just to... uh, process and pray through how are you really our master how are we really serving you and do we really expect and believe that you're coming back and if so lord uh, i pray that you would allow us just to continue to stay in tune in the word to stay in tune in prayer as we as we as we get excited about the king of glory coming back but lord if we don't have these thoughts if these aren't a reality god would you shift some things in our lives to make this a reality Because, Lord, my prayer is that every person has the expectation and the faith that the King of glory is coming back. Oh, Lord, get us ready for your return. In Jesus' name we pray. Have a great day, guys. Thanks.